I don't want to offend anybody, but I guess without a better way of putting it, I think the smartest people often make the worst teachers. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Bates is brilliant. Trying to decide by the way. which which yeah. which way I should be offended. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. Whether you're working on a personal project or managing enterprise infrastructure, you deserve simple, affordable, and accessible cloud computing solutions so you can take your project to the next level. Simplify your life with Linode's Linux VMs to develop, deploy, and scale your applications faster and easier. Get started on Linode today with $100 in free credit for our listeners. You can find all the details at linode.com slash changelog, or if you're not at your desk, just text changelog to 474747 and get instant access to that 100 bucks. Linode has 11 global data centers and provides 24-7, 365 human support with no tiers or handoffs, regardless of your plan size. In addition to shared and dedicated compute instances, you can use that $100 credit on S3-compatible object storage, manage Kubernetes, and more. Visit linode.com changelog and click on the Create Free Account button to get started, or just text changelog to 474747. Get started today on Linode. Let's do it. It's go time. Welcome to Go Time, your source for diverse discussions from around the Go community. Real talk for a sec. This episode has some audio issues. Mark was on vacation and he had to call in from his iPad, so his voice sounds harsh throughout and he frequently blows out the mic. We tried to fix it up in post, but it's garbage in, garbage out, as they say, so please bear with us. The show's a good one, so I think it's worth your ears bleeding just a little bit, but you can be the judge on that and have a listen for yourself. Here we go. Hello, and welcome to Go Time. Today we're talking about teaching. We're going to be exploring this subject with some great teachers and experienced teachers, including John Calhoun. Hello, John. Hey, Matt. How's it going? Pretty good. How about you? Yeah, not bad, thanks. We've also got Johnny Borsico. Hello, Johnny. Hello, it's good to be back. It's always good to have you here, Johnny. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, Mark Bates is here. Hello, Mark. <laughs> Hello, Matthew. <laughs> How are you, mate? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm doing all right. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad, not bad. I'm um, I'm excited about this episode because I feel like there's a lot to this subject. I think what you're looking for is there's a lot to learn about teaching. Mm. Uh, there we go. Beautifully put. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I stole it off a of bazooka, Joe gum wrapper. <laughs> <laughs> that is a reference I get. I haven't had one of those in forever. <laughs> I know. Are they still around? With Halloween coming around. I'm like, I need to go somewhere and find some bazooka. And, you, they are still around. My kids had some recently, and they they haven't gotten any softer. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you that much. Okay, so maybe we could start off by um, a little bit of an intro because I don't know that our listeners really know how much experience you all have in teaching. So, how did you get into teaching, and what sort of teaching do you each do? Um, and Bates, we'll start with you, mate. Yeah, I, th I have a feeling the three of us do very different styles of teaching, which is going to be fun, obviously, to talk about today. Hmm. For me, I first kind of started getting into it with uh, writing books about 10, 10 years or so ago. And then about three or four years ago, when I met uh, Corey and at the time Brian Kettleson, and we were talking about training and thinking about doing something together. And we started Gopher Guides. And so for me, my experience with training has been a lot of in person, in a classroom, three days, four days teaching, you know, it, it, more of a, not a traditional teaching style, but in the, the in classroom teaching. Uh, and then even last year, we were starting to do a lot of virtual training. So of course, this year now we're doing <laughs> nothing but virtual trainings. So that's kind of my experience. It comes from doing workshops and in-person teaching, virtual teaching, kind of with the big groups and, and, and dynamics um, and somewhat to the book stuff early on that kind of led me into it. 
Yeah. And Johnny, you do class classroom based teaching sometimes too, don't you? Yeah, it's uh my journey is a interesting one. The uh, a lot of the sort of the teaching uh, um I was uh, sort of exposed to um came from uh, sort of being part of workshops uh, um sort of that, that that were aimed at teaching um programming to beginners, right? So think Rails Bridge and, and Go Bridge and these and, and these kind of things. So basically, you know, at, at first I'd go in and I'd participate as a TA and help students and whatnot. And then eventually, you know, basically you, you start picking up enough of sort of uh, um how people learn how different their the different styles of learning right um there are folks who can just hear something and internalize it and know what to do um there are folks who hear it but they don't it doesn't really sort of stick until they actually you know try something and do it like you see all these kinds of you know very different learning styles auditory learners visual learners all these kinds of things and that's when it sort of a, a sort of dawned on me that hey like you know i i seem to have sort of a um, the ability to sort of a uh, um, tailor things for the different learners so basically i was and trying to learn how to teach, I just wanted to help. But I'm like, okay, like you, you, you're able to sort of uh, um, convey certain information differently to different folks in the audience, so that everybody sort of walks out, you know, like uh, be satisfied with with their journey, with their learning process, right? And the biggest thing is is knowing how to sort of leave enough of a spark there, so that when they leave the workshop, they can continue the learning on their own, right? So it, it's kind of became this this thing that I, I eventually saw also started doing professionally, not just as a, you know, as a hobby or way to give them back or whatever it is, it sort of became a professional kind of thing. Um, and, and I do other things now uh, in, in that realm, but really it just, just so happens, right? It, it wasn't something that I really wanted to get into. Mm. That's interesting that you talk about the different people learning in different ways, because I mean, how do you do that? How can you create a course or something that tailors or is tailored to these different can i just say before we get into the one size fits all kind of metaphor and the deep topics can we hear from john see how I john know, got right? into learning john. Oh. <laughs> matt doesn't want to hear from me it's okay matt's like forget john uh, i was yeah, gonna that's... get to that in a minute i have faith in matt <laughs> well john you don't do classroom based teaching as as much do you you have no. video courses so that's another that is quite different so yeah mine was uh when i started learning go i realized that there weren't any resources like like rails tutorials how i learned ruby on rails and i really liked that project based book or video course or whatever it ends up it ends up being both if you want but um i really liked that approach and when i was learning go they didn't have it so i basically just started you know taking notes with my journey and i got to a point where i was like i should probably turn this into something and share it with people and try to create something similar and then it just happened to be that the startup i was working at was in some you know rough times and it made more sense for me to just branch out and see how that went. So at first I started doing consulting with the teaching is like you know the two sort of augmenting each other, but it didn't take very long until I actually found a place where I was living off of just the teaching in income. So that's what I kind of focused on and it's been a lot more fun. It's it's really rewarding to, you know, see people get stuff and to take a different approach and it's it's kind of interesting to me cuz I I see the benefit in having all these different styles put together, and I I really feel like, and I'm hoping as a result of COVID, we start to see all of these sort of get merged together and sort of find ways to find the best of both worlds. Because up until now, I just don't feel like that's happened. But we can go into the one-size-fits-all discussion first. That's completely fine. <laughs> or, Matt, do you want to talk about your teaching experience? See, Matt's making that face like he doesn't think he's a teacher, but we all know he is. Well, I've done... Even like better, a... he just farted. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very similar face with that. I'm going to have to ban you for that, I'm afraid, Mike. <laughs> well, yeah, I've done it at conferences and stuff. Sometimes at conferences you get asked to do a workshop or something. Um, so, But I, don't, I haven't done that very often. And one thing I'll say is it's absolutely exhausting. And that shocked me of how draining it actually is to, mm -hmm. to, to do teaching. Do you find the same thing? It's exhausting. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, cause like John, you know, I used to do a lot, uh, like both John and Johnny, uh, I used to do like the TA and then the rails bridge. In fact, Johnny, I think you and I might've even taught a couple together yeah. over the years, like rails yeah, bridge sure. kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and then I did, you know, obviously the video stuff, which I still do. And I had Metacast, which was those kind of bite sized snippets. Um, for a long time. So there's there's a lot of different ways you can learn. But overall, regardless of how you're doing it, it's still very daunting. 
and still challenging. And when you've got a classroom full of people, um, I know for me, you know, if I'm standing in front of, I'm at a corporate client for three or four days and I'm standing there for eight hours a day, training and being energetic and motivating and accessible and, you know, all those things you need to be to be a good teacher. You know, it's, it's exhausting. I go back to the hotel room and I lay on the bed and I pass out. I don't like, that's it. That's my night. <laughs> my night is I go back to the hotel room, order room service, and I just watch TV until I fall asleep because I'm so drained yeah. from that day. Why does this sound like an alibi? <laughs> it very well could be no here's uh, the one thing i'll add on top of that though is that the, the funny thing is you know most folks think that you know to be a teacher you kind of have to be sort of a, a, a naturally sort of outgoing have the sort of personality that sort of brings out you know people from from the sort of a self-contained you know sort of a personality types and that kind of thing but it's really n not all right i know for me like i wouldn't say my, i'm an extrovert like i have i have little spikes right so when i'm teaching i have to literally like almost like flipping a switch in my mind it says okay now you are you you need to be someone else you need to be someone you need who, to be energetic and motivating energetic and, and motivating excited. exactly yep. so you, you, you literally you have to kind of flip that switch this is okay now it's no longer about you like you you'd normally like to be introverted and to be and you have your own space to have quiet and all these things but this is not what you're about to do now right so you, you literally have to change become someone else in order to do that obviously the, the more time you, you you sort of spend doing it the more experienced you are the more naturally that comes but it is not an easy thing at all to put yourself in the right mindset to do it's not and that that's my problem i have the exact same problem i'm i'm famously i, I call an introverted extra an extroverted introvert <laughs> where i'm almost always introverted but i have spike like johnny said like when i'm doing something like this or i'm teaching or i'm at a conference you you see me at a much higher level of activity and much you know much more outgoing and energetic than when you see me offline where i'm just kind of quiet sitting in the, in the room and just relaxing it, you do have but you have to put yourself in that mindset it, and that's that's the daunting and exhausting part at least for me anyway is it like a persona then do you feel like you you have a different persona when you like do you feel like you become someone else to do it a little bit i don't know i, I think we all have personas when we hit a stage and, and whether that stage is a classroom or in front of a thousand people or go for con or something, right? We, we, we all, when we're in front of an audience, we all have a persona, whether you admit to having a persona or not. Um, we're all just a little bit different and we're all, we all tweak ourselves slightly different just to be up on that stage. And that goes for just speakers too, who are also educators. We shouldn't discount those who just, who give 30 minute talks, 45 minute talks at conferences. They're also educators. And we could talk about what it means to be that sort of an educator at some point too, I think, which would be kind of fun. In some regards, I'm also curious to hear from John to hear about this because you know I've been fortunate enough to have done sort of the face to face and have done the online. Um, and I think the worst possible combination of all these things is when you have to do a virtual training where there are no faces, there there's no cameras, there you can't see, you can't tell that somebody's getting something or not, you know, the way you can in, in a live classroom. I mean, these are the absolute worst for me. Like I, I get, I power through mm -hmm. them, but they are my least favorite, right? When there's no cameras, you can't see anybody. You just, you just a voice on the other end, right? Uh, um, but yeah. the, you know, for it, it's, it's a slightly different thing, perhaps with John, when maybe you, you were doing a screencast and you put together a video, uh, I've done those, but you know, it's almost like you, you can give yourself like a bit more sort of a, you can forgive yourself a little more because you know that if you have a bad take, you can sort of record it again. <laughs> and I know you've done this with Metacast as well. Um, so, oh, yeah. The, yeah, uh, Mark, so the, I'm curious, John, like, do you feel like you have to become someone else, like a different personality, right? And when you're doing the, the, the screencast and the recordings? It's, it's definitely there some, like, I remember one piece of feedback. I don't even think it was that long ago I got, but somebody basically made the comment that my writing felt way more energetic than this one video <laughs> that they watched. And it was like the very first video I had released for one of the older courses. And I'm like, yeah, and those older ones, I'd really did not quite get that transition. Like I didn't know how to do it. Even now it's something I struggle with because I'm, you know, like I'm not interacting with people as much. So like a lot of it feels like, I feel like I'm a random person on YouTube, just like that's crazy high energy. And I'm like, and I know I'm nowhere near that level, but it just feels so weird to me because I'm like, that's not me at all. So it's, it's kind of challenging. And you're definitely right that it is hard because you don't, get that immediate feedback. So like, I can't go do a workshop and then come back and be like, okay, that worked. That was the right energy level. It's, it's literally just release some videos and, and hope that it's right. And 
you know, I do occasionally get that feedback, but it's probably not as immediate. Um, maybe people are a little more forgiving because it's a recorded thing and they just kind of realize that's the way it works. I don't really know. Um, maybe that's why I've got the really bright colors in the background. That'll brighten me up, <laughs> make me seem energetic. Yeah, I think a lot of people discount how hard it is to do video, you know, like John does. Like, you know, I used to do it with Metacast. Uh, there's a lot that goes into that. You know, that idea of, A, just having to come up with the fresh content constantly uh, is is very difficult. But then that energy level and that how do I get this concept across to nobody? Like, it's not even like a virtual training where you, at least you know there are people on the other end to hear your mm -hmm. words. Like, mm -hmm. you're recording and you don't have that. And you really have to pretend like, what is this audience that I'm talking to? Who are these people? What do they want to hear? What are they reacting to in this video? It's, it's really hard. That's why I stopped doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I think people also forget the, like, for every, like, 10 minutes you see, there was probably, like, three hours of, of all sorts of other stuff, including bad takes. Right. Like yep. I've, I've literally sat there one morning and spent three hours trying to record the same 15 minute video. <laughs> and I'm just like, I, this isn't happening. Like, I don't know why it's just not happening today. And it's so frustrating. And meanwhile, you got people like, when's that going to be out? And you're like, I'd love to give it to you, but it's not there. It's frustrating when you're doing a really, really, really good take too. And something doesn't work. Like mm -hmm. there's a bug or some, mm -hmm. for some reason you're like, and if I refresh, Nothing happens. Nothing. Everything's broken. Okay. <laughs> hit yeah. the course. Hit stop. Let me back right. up. What the hell just happened? <laughs> you know? And then you got to get like everything back in the same place in terms of your screen. And, you know, because if you, I move, you know, if I move to say the browser, I have to get back to my editor, make sure the cursors are in the right place. So everything mm -hmm. lines up again. Right. It's a real, it's a real struggle when you hit those things. At least live, you can kind of make a joke about it and, mm -hmm. and move on. Right. Keep it moving. Right. Yeah, it's there's that there's that too. The I'm curious to see. So you guys have all have, has everybody else done virtual conference talks this year? Yep, I haven't yeah. given one, but you, John, mm -hmm. uh, John, you haven't, but Johnny, you have, right? Yes. Yep. So it's been interesting because I think you know we're all having to do these kind of virtual talks, and and somebody, Johnny, you were talking about the um, energy, mm -hmm. you know, and I've had a couple conferences this year request that we pre-record mm. our talks as opposed to giving them live because, right. you know, it's a virtual world. We can do whatever the hell I want. Right. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, I hated it. I did it once and I really, really hated pre-recording my talk. Um, and, and the, the energy, um, you know, I'm standing there in this, in an empty room talking to nobody and I can hit record and, uh, as many times as I need to. Right. And there's no spontaneity there. There's no energy. There's no nervous energy that kicks you up a bit, mm -hmm. you know? So even knowing that people are virtually listening on the other side, <laughs> even if I can't see their faces, that nervous energy of just knowing that my words are being heard and my face is being seen, I have to kind of be on my game. Yeah. That's one of the biggest problems I find I've been finding with a virtual is that energy. And then that, what John said, the feed, uh, Johnny said, the feeding back, like I scan the crowd. You've got to scan when you're teaching. Mm -hmm. If you're not constantly scanning your audience and looking for people in trouble, mm -hmm. then that's, you're, you're not doing it right. Right. <laughs> you're not doing your job right. One of the worst things is basically if you have normally, like I think in sort of a regular conversations, you know, there's, there's opportunities like uh, impromptu, like jokes and, you know, a little banter, that kind of thing. And these things, I, I, I find that these things work their way into my teaching as well. You know, like, you know, something will happen, you know, it, it, it's, it's unscripted and it's natural, feels authentic, right? You know, you, you'll, mm -hmm. th there'll be opportunities for a joke or something like that, right? You, you can kind of play with these things, right? If you're, if yeah. you're inexperienced, these things feel like, oh my God, like something bad just happened, right? But the experienced speaker, they actually turn these around and, and use them to their advantage right that sort of you know skillful thing you, you, you can't use any of that sort of skill or any of these moments right when you're doing a pre-recorded thing like, it, try, imagine like giving a like a, a, having a joke like on a pre-recorded um sort of a, a, a talk that like how weird is that right so you have to imagine uh, in your head I've that they're, they're... <laughs> did you like add a laugh track as well no, but, I, but I, here's how sad i am i paused for the laugh <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. I let, I just get took a breath. Let the let the laugh happen. 
and then you continue. And then you can pause <laughs> for laughter. Yeah, Amazing. but it shouldn't, shouldn't be like two minutes, Mark. <laughs> You're not getting <laughs> no, a standing true. ovation I, after every joke. I, I, admittedly, the last conference talk I did, I did wait for the standing ovation. Uh, and I did kept telling people to calm down and just relax. It, it was mayhem. <laughs> bedlam. Oh, great. That's great. Uh, but no, but to Johnny say like those jokes, but I'll, I'll tell you, one of the biggest things for us uh, at Gopher Guides, like when we were doing the in-person stuff, we don't have this opportunity with the virtual uh, nearly as much because of what John said, Johnny, both of them, everybody's kind of saying that that lack of interaction um, is when, you know, we're in classrooms or classrooms, you know, co- we're companies and we're, we're got 20, 30 people in a room or whatever it is, you know, you're talking, you're having lunch, you're learning about them as people, as individuals, as a company, right? And there's a lot of stuff you, I, I like to just kind of take some of those in jokes from them and incorporate it back in and, and kind of some of what they're working on. And when I talk about you know, if I'm trying to come up with an off the cuff kind of an example in my, you know, to describe something, somebody a question, whatever, I try to use their experiences. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's say Uber, which we've done a ton of training for, um, you know, Although we're going to talk shares about shares are available. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> yes, um, you know, but like we'll talk about, you know, I'll t- I'll use, you know. Uh, self-driving cars a lot as examples because that's the group i was i I was doing a lot of training for you know and using those examples because they understand them Mm -hmm. you know and they can relate to those things but the other big thing that you don't get virtually is in like for us was the in-class demos like i love doing live demos in class Mm -hmm. and johnny i'm sure you have the exact same thing right like someone asked that question you're like oh let me just open up vim let's code it Let's yep. see what happens. And what's interesting yep. as we've found is that every single class we've done um, over the last three plus years, uh, we have taken some of what we've done in class as demos or discussions, and it's been incorporated back into the training material, usually that night or like the following week. Yep. Right. And, and it's, but you need that face to face. You need those questions, that spontaneity of someone just raising their hand, not even raising their hand, just shouting it out, that you mm. don't get over virtual, which is a bit tough. What's up, gophers? Are you looking for a way to instantly debug and troubleshoot your applications and services running in production on Kubernetes? That's a mouthful. Well, Pixie gives you a magical API to get instant debug data. And the best part is this doesn't involve changing code. There are no manual UIs and all this lives inside Kubernetes. Pixie is an API which lives inside your platform, harvests all of your data that you need, and exposes a bunch of interfaces that you can ping to get data you need. Pixie is essentially like a decentralized Splunk. It's a programmable edge intelligence platform which captures metrics, traces, logs, and events without any code changes. And the team behind Pixie is working hard to bring it to market for broad use by the end of 2020, but I'm here to tell you how you can get your hands on the beta today. Links are in the show notes, so check them out so you can click through to the beta and their Slack community. Once again, links from the show notes, check them out, and look forward to Pixie Day coming soon. So we've talked a little bit about what's bad about the virtual. Have there any, been any like <laughs> positives to it? No travel. Well, <laughs> no travel is, is huge. <laughs> like for, and maybe it's a little bit different depending on what you're doing, but I know from my end, one of the things I really like about doing videos and like things like, despite that there are definitely some drawbacks, it's the fact that you have this massive reach in comparison. So like, Rather than spending six months traveling, I can spend six months like, how do I really refine this challenging topic and make a like a much more involved uh, project? And then the second part for me has always been that the amount, like you've said, it's exhausting to teach in person in workshops. So like realistically, you couldn't go someplace and teach for a month. Like that, that would just kill you. It'd be too much. Yeah. But but like, I mean, teachers can, do it every day. Let's not discount what. Yeah. Like. Yeah. All of our teachers, if God help them, they're all doing virtual right now. So, you know, kudos to every teacher in the in the world right now who's having to deal with all this. But yeah, go on. I but couldn't yeah. do it for a month. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but basically, you can make bigger projects and, and teach them in the online venue because you kind of know that people have that chance to take breaks themselves when they need them. 
Um, you don't have to produce it all at once. So like, are there other you know advantages you've noticed to doing the virtual stuff? I find that instead of doing big eight hour days, when we're doing in person, we've uh, scaled it back. So we do more days at less hours because standing in front, yeah, as we've all come to learn this year, some more than others, sitting in front of zoom for eight hours a day is a real drag. Uh, and it's really sure. energy sapping and, it, and it's just, it's, you know, it could be so hard on you. So, you know, we've kind of moved into like these four hour blocks with nice breaks and, and people need that. They can't sit in front of a computer, but we've been finding that's working very, very well. People are, are engaged for that time, mm-hmm. you know, and they're active and then they have the rest of their day to do their regular work and stuff like that. So for us, the virtual has actually been quite nice. Uh, we, we've been doing really, our platform was kind of built for it anyway. But what I miss personally, like I said, is that interaction, that face-to-face, that one-on-one, which is odd because I hate people. <laughs> it's, I imagine that I, I try to simulate that with like a Slack community, but it's still, I know it's not the same, but it's one of those things where you do get the feedback from people like, oh, I'm on this video and this is the challenging thing I've ran into. And you can incorporate that into future lessons or you can give examples there. Mm-hmm. And so like there are ways, I imagine with like corporate training, that's trickier in the sense that you can't like roll up a Slack, you know, bring up a Slack and be like, this is your corporate Slack for just this thing. Like maybe you can make a channel, no, but even then that's kind of hard. Yeah, you usually have to use it. Usually they have Slack we found or stuff like that and it's a back channel. Sorry, I'd need to just say that uh, other annoying apps are also available. <laughs> that's true. Not just Slack. Uh, not just Slack. <laughs> not, just, not just Slack. Uh, you know, what? Zoom. Uh, <laughs> we can use, you know, uh, we've also just used, sometimes just use the in, you know, uh, chat, you know, the chat and zoom or whatever platform we're using, uh, to, you know, it's when you're doing the live training that, that kind of offline community isn't as important. Certainly when you're in the room, uh, the virtual, you definitely need a way for people to funnel and zoom's got the webinar features with the raising your hands and asking questions and polling. So there's some decent stuff built in for teaching that, that can be quite helpful there. But yeah, it's having, like I said, having that interaction is really hard over, over Zoom. Is there anything specific about teaching Go? Because I know, Bates, you did Ruby. You've done Ruby training and things. Does Go's minimalist design make teaching easier? Is it easier because Go is kind of a, has this smaller... API generally, right, in the language. Go simple. That's what's so nice about it. I think that's why we all like Go. I often joke in class that Go is kind of a WYSIWYG language, mm-hmm. right? It, it's what you see is what you get. Like you look at a Go file and there's, there's no magic there. Right. The imports are at the top. You know, there's all your stuff. There's not a lot going on. There's not that crazy meta programming that you get with dynamic languages. Like, you know, and you're trying to when I, you know, doing Ruby and, you, and Johnny definitely can attest to this, you know, you're trying to mentor junior developers at, you know, at work and stuff like that. And there's a million ways to do anything and there, none of them are necessarily easy or make total sense. <laughs> you know, I have a language like Go where it's very clean and easy to read and it's optimized for reading. Um, yeah. I, th- I think makes it a lot easier to teach. I think the fundamentals are so much easier to teach in Go than a lot of other languages, to be perfectly honest. That's my opinion. So have you ever, like, if either, Johnny, I think you said you taught Ruby stuff too. I could mm-hmm. be wrong, though. Mm-hmm. Um, did either of you ever run into cases where, like, you're teaching and somebody's like, that goes against our style guide as, like, how we do these <laughs> things? Yeah, all the time. Oh, boy. Oh, I've got stories for you. And, 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 <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and here's, the thing. here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? Like, currently, I, I, I do, I do uh, trainings for, uh, you know, um, sort of on, on platforms like Arati and whatnot. But also, I do sort of the, the private corporate stuff. And, and the private corporate stuff, I tell you, it's it's the one that is has um, folks coming to it with the strongest held views and beliefs about style guide and approaches and this and that. So I, I feel like I spend about a third of the class, right? I sort of a, if if I, if I look at the amount of time I spend, sort of saying, well, this is like 
C, but different in that way. <laughs> this is like C++, but different in that way. This is like Java, but different in that way. Don't don't name your interfaces with an I in front, right? Because we don't do that. <laughs> like all these kinds of things. I sp- basically, I, I'm spending my time sort of getting them to leave the baggage at the door, right? So that they can appreciate Go for what Go is, right? Rather than saying, well, I have this, you know, the way of doing OO in my head. How do I do that in Go, right? No, <laughs> it's, you, don't, you, don't know, you don't just overlay that knowledge on top of Go, right? Which is why I think you know it makes it go is is really as as a teacher right you have to sort of know how to sort of uh, sort of relate things that other folks folks coming from other languages and other technologies might already know like you know it, because they're gonna come in the door with that with that knowledge right you have to somehow reframe it right but at the same time as a learner you ha- and I can't say this often enough like you have to leave that baggage about all other languages that you know and love right uh, at the door when you come to learn Go like you have to really really like like learn go for what it is and then right have your preferences and your judgment and how it's better at this or worse at that or whatever it is right leave that stuff at the door yeah that's a really tricky thing to balance because i know exactly what you're saying i'll often say oh you know in java this is kind of akin to this in java or ruby or whatever i can try to make some comparisons to hopefully to the languages they know in the room but you know, hope and that hopefully I also know <laughs> I can use to relate. But at the same point, that like I, you know, thing I always tell people is like, don't code Go like Ruby. Don't code Go like Java. Don't code Go like, and also don't code Ruby like Go. Don't code Java like C. Right? Like, I mean, these things carry all across all languages. But you do have to keep reiterating that in class. And a lot of people come at you and say, well, I would do this in C sharp like this, <laughs> and it's like, well. That's C sharp. We don't do that in Go. That's not a thing in Go. But how do I do it? You don't. You don't need to do it in Go. It's not a. It's not a concept in Go. Right, yeah, right. but I need to do it in C. But you don't need to do it in Go. Like it's like how do you get people <laughs> sometimes past those things? Like I I know how to do it in this language, and it's like well, mm-hmm. yeah, it's you're not it's hard. you're not swapping you're not swapping syntax. This is not just a yeah. syntax swap, right? <laughs> exactly. Like it's, it's a different way of thinking. It's not a syntax yeah. syntax swap. Yeah, it's a yeah, exactly. I once saw somebody code and this still blows my mind a little bit because I would never contemplate doing it. Um, but I saw it and I and it just blew my mind that somebody did this. They wrote a try catch mechanism in Go. Mm. <laughs> what with Yeah, panics? using yeah, with panics mm. and, def- and recover you know, recovers and stuff like that. And it was both remarkably beautiful and terrible. <laughs> at the same time it was in a package called strux which was even better because mm. uh, <laughs> that's why you put exception handling clearly <laughs> put exception handling. Uh, and so it was a clear case of somebody saying like i need this this is how i know how to code i know only know how to code with try catch and finally mm-hmm. uh, and that's what they built they built a system that allowed them to do try catch and finally because that's how they know how to code and and the idea of error handling or go just made no sense to them right. um yeah it's breaking people of previous habits is really it's hard. hard it's hard yeah one of the things i've found there is that when people ask how to like this is how i do it and see it, it sometimes it's more about trying to figure out what's the underlying problem that you're trying to solve so yeah, we can right. look at like what is the correct approach to take in this other mindset and that can be very hard because sometimes people come at you with just no i just want to do the same thing and other mm-hmm. times they're like no i'm actually trying to solve a problem but they don't ask that question they ask yeah. <laughs> how do i do this other thing and you're like well let's take a step back and i know that can be challenging especially cuz we see this on the gopher slack all the time or beginners ask that and you try to say like, well, what problem are you solving? And like, they don't know why you're asking that. And then you know, when they finally get it, it's awesome. But up until then, you almost sound like yeah. that jerk who's just like, no, I won't answer that question. You need to give me a different question. You got to pull it out of them sometimes. You got to right. pull up that problem. Definitely. And there are some people, like you said, who just want that answer. It's like, you know, and I've, it's funny. You, there's always those people who, and the other people hung up on that syntax and the other people hung up on their, what their way of knowing that when you keep telling them that's not a thing you do in Go, that's not an issue in Go, that's not, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, I'll often say like, I've been programming Go for seven years now and I've never had to do that. That has mm-hmm. never come up, you know, whatever the right, thing is, right, like, you know, like, right. but how would you do it? I'm like, I don't know, it's never come it's up. It's never it's happened. Not an issue. <laughs> right. Like, you know, so, but you've got you've to try to answer that as best you can. No, it's mm-hmm. not always easy. 
Yeah. So if we could turn that then into a, a piece of advice for someone that's going to that's gonna learn Go, and maybe they do come from a different language, I guess that advice is that you have to kind of be open-minded and you, you, you're never going to do away with everything you've learned, especially because people invest years and get really good. I mean, I used to do C Sharp. I, I've built some amazing abstract class hierarchies and all sorts of things with abstract classes, with generics. In C Sharp, with the generics, you can, you can put constraints on the types that you're allowed. They can be interfaces um, and or they can be you know, base classes and things. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of really, uh, I felt like I'd become really good at that. So in a way, we, we're asking people to sort of, by, by you say, leave the baggage, but that baggage is valuable to them. They've invested a lot in that, haven't they? Context, though. I mean, yeah. you have to have context. Like a certain skill is going to be more valuable, right, in certain contexts and in, in, in others, right? So it's you kind of have to know... Again, going back to the, the what kinds of problems are you solving in and what problem domain are you working in, right? Like, is is this you know a tool better suited for this kind of problem, right? So the, mm. the all all these sort of virtues that we you know software engineers we aspire to, right? Use the right tool for the job, and you know the you know like craftspersonship and and stuff like that. Like you know we 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 aspire to all these things, and then except when it comes to our favorite programming language, right? We feel the need to defend well, Java, you know, it does does things the right way, like. I, I, I like the way it does things, and and why can I do this in, in in Java? Well, this is not Java, this is not Gooby, this is not Python. This is you know this is Go, right? So like learn learn that tool, right? And, and but I will I will admit, right? I'm I'm gonna get after the soapbox for a little bit. I will admit that it's not unrealistic to say that the language you've been sort of a, a trained to use or learned to use for years and years and years has shaped the way you think about problems. Right. It's not Absolutely. unrealistic to, to say that. Right. So naturally, right. When you're presented with a problem, you want to solve the problem. But the tools you have, the facilities you have in your mind, right, are still contextualized for the previous language you were using. Right. So the people who sort of, uh, you know, sort of jump from language to language to language. I mean, I'm sure you've, we've all done this because I'm sure we all work in multiple languages um, these days. Like you'll switch, swap your editor. Right. And you'll start to type go inside of your, you know, uh, TypeScript or your JavaScript. And then you'll be like, oh, what am I doing? Right. And then you, you or you'll switch to, to VS Code where you have your Go code and you start typing TypeScript. Right. And like, say, oh, like, you know, you're kind of jumping around. But I think those those who have to work in these multiple environments multiple languages are in much better position right to sort of uh, the ability to sort of uh, um, change their thinking sort of at will right to say okay well and for this particular problem this language solves it this way right whereby if the only thing you're ever sort of a uh, you know the, the one sort of hammer you have right it's it's java or it's c sharp or it's you know c plus plus or whatever it is you're going to try to hammer every nail with it right so again one of those things that we basically tell ourselves in the software engineering community like hey use the right tool for the job well you, yeah if we're gonna like say that let's let's apply it across the board right it's funny on this because I do write JavaScript and TypeScript as part of my day job at the moment. And I actually do feel like I write, I've taken th lessons from Go and, and I do apply them actually. Because it's simpler, because Go is simpler, I feel like you, you can almost do it that way. And I feel like, like, for example, there's loads of language features in JavaScript and TypeScript that I just don't use. And and I'll I'll just write very simple little functions. Do you know what I mean? Like it has actually changed the way I write JavaScript too. You could be, you could be seen as being sort of a, a not proficient enough, though. Uh, again, it's, it's it's one of those things where somebody who's an expert, hmm. you know, a JavaScript developer, or or they really know TypeScript inside and out, and they see your code, right? Yeah. They think like, oh, you're you're just a novice, right? right? You're not using you know these super duper elegant mechanism, you know, these special you know esoteric knowledge about the language or whatever it is that I happen to know because I have you know dozens of years of experience and nothing, right? Mm -hmm. They're gonna see you as a novice whereby you're trying to keep things simple mm -hmm. right but they see it as a lack of knowledge that's interesting yeah because but i even do it in go because like i don't really use channels very often these days in go for example no neither do i yeah. I've, i very rarely have ever used channels to be perfectly honest and matter of fact one of the things when we teach channels we have a, a slide at the beginning and matt it's got a one of the quotes there's a couple of quotes one of them is from you oh, dear. which was uh cory i think said Without that 
<laughs> I can't remember what your quote was, but it was about not using channels. And I can't remember what it is now. But Corey like had said, like, I find that once I, you know, I start using fa- channels and by the end, I've ended up refactoring them out anyway. Um, right. You know, and uh, that's that's part of the learning experience, though, hmm. is over sometimes overusing mechanisms when you first start learning a language, you know? Yeah. What concepts in Go are, in your experience, then, particularly troublesome for people like you mentioned errors earlier interfaces um i found have been one of the biggest struggles in class um people <laughs> really struggle with how interfaces work and go everything else i thought like we can talk about channels and people will get it i can talk <laughs> about go routines and people will get it like mm-hmm. see all, all this sorts of stuff when i start talking about interfaces people are like wait a minute i don't get it right is that <laughs> because they have already this previous knowledge and then they know how interfaces work. Yeah, yeah. Where's the implements I personable mm. or something, right? <laughs> I, I think people are just so used the to that. The service impl factory. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like interfaces are definitely weird in the sense that you're expecting them to follow a certain like paradigm that, that yeah. usually comes from like a Java or something like that where, you know, you return the interface or, you know, like it's it's not the same as Go where it's like when you write the implementation, you don't mention the interface like at all. You just yeah. and they're like, how how is this related? Like, you how, didn't how are you connecting those dots? Yeah, how yeah, you connect? Yeah. yeah, they can't. They, yeah, like if it's not in a code, how how are you? How do you know? It's magic. <laughs> they, I don't like magic. <laughs> and it's they just don't confusing. get it. It's funny. It is. Well, I always say, you know, it's implicit versus explicit, right? We don't have to say foo implements bar, right? It just does. Mm-hmm. And then people are always like, but how do you know it does? I'm like, it just does. <laughs> like, they're like, but how do I know that my thing implements it? It's like, well, you look at the function definition you're trying to call. And it says, I need an I.O. writer. And you look at the doc for an I.O. writer. Hey, my thing happens to implement that. Fantastic. But it, <laughs> people don't get those two things. Like, and the, the other, the big question I get a lot too, is I'm sure you guys too, is, well, how do I know if I'm not implementing some other interface? Yes. Well, who cares? Who cares? <laughs> right. You could you be. Are? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you could be. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, I remember that exact thought like what yeah. happens if by accident i've done uh, i happen to just match the method and signature for something else and then it gets right. abused and it gets used in the wrong way um but it just doesn't happen um and because yeah. because of the simplicity and for example you can't have overloaded methods in some languages mm-hmm. you can have the same method name but with different arguments yeah. and go sort of you know doesn't let you do that so yeah, it feels at the beginning like that's that's constraining you, and it mm-hmm. feels like well they need to add that feature. But actually, it it pays dividends when it comes to maintainability, readability, and and clarity, doesn't it? Yeah. But those are abstract concepts, right? You're talking about here. These are things that are subjective, right? And the, the, you know, like readability. That's something that you know what you find readable may be not so readable for me, right? So it's hard to get someone who's who's very used to sort of a. a um, sort of a seeing a certain style of code and, and attribute their own idioms for for what readable code and that other technology that they know and love is right at, you know basically applying that and say hey, well that's what readable code is supposed to look like it's very hard to sort of a, a, again carrying all that stuff over to go it's almost like you have to relearn basically okay what does readable at its core, what is readability all about, right? You have to get to that underlying level. And I'll tell you, in, in a class of eight hours, you know, you're not going to have time to talk about the theory of, of, of the readability, what's readable, what's not. You don't have time for that. You're trying to cram as much information in, in, in people's heads of, as possible in as efficient a manner you know, as possible so that they can retain all that knowledge you're dumping on them you know, in, in such a short amount of time. Right? You don't have time to dive into the theory. You have to get to the practical, right? But the thing is, without the theory to understand how to approach the language, then it becomes hard to say, well, trust me, like you're not gonna, I've been doing Go for a long time. You're not gonna run into this particular problem you keep telling me about right now. What's up, Gophers? Do you have an app in production that's slower than you like? Of course you do. I know. But seriously, is the performance of your apps all over the place, sometimes fast, sometimes slow? Do you even know why? Well, with Datadog, you will. You can troubleshoot your app's performance with end-to-end tracing and in one click, correlate those Go traces with related logs and metrics. 
You can also use Datadog's detailed flame graphs to identify bottlenecks and latency in your apps. Start tracking the performance of your apps today with a free trial at datadog.com slash go time. And here's a bonus. If you sign up for a trial and install the agent, Datadog will send you a free t-shirt. That's a nice bonus. Once again, datadog.com slash go time. So changing to topics, Matt, sorry, I don't mean to take over hosting here for a second. Oh, please, but a, oh, please do, mate. Please do. A lot of people have been asking, like, how, you know, what would we recommend for people who want to learn how to go, like, like learn mm-hmm. how to write go, like, you know, what ways of teaching or what ways of self-learning, I think, is mm-hmm. really the question that these we've been getting right. on Twitter and Slack is how right. do I best self-learn go? And I'm curious to hear, because we, again, I think we've all taught go in very different ways. Uh, some of us in multiple ways, whether it be books, blogs, videos, workshops, in person, virtual, like you know, podcasts, conference talks. Like, there's a lot of ways we have taught Go. But I'm curious to hear how people, how everybody on the panel here would, uh, what people would suggest to people who are learning Go. Like, you know, what are some great ways of approaching it? I can say, the number one piece of advice I have for people is to not just follow along. Um, whether you're in a workshop or you're doing a course or whatever else, if you just follow along with the material there and that's it, you generally, it doesn't stick. But if you take the material there and you try to you know, slightly change it, like let's say Johnny's teaching something and he's like, this is how we create a channel and we send some values through it. And they try to maybe create a buffered channel or they create a channel of a different type or they you know, mess around with it a little bit and, and experiment and t- try to get a feel for what these different things do. Those people tend to have a much better understanding of how it works And sometimes you'll write code that just doesn't work and you don't quite get it. And then all of a sudden you have a question to ask. You can say, why doesn't this work? I apparently didn't understand it as well as I thought. And like even for courses, it's it's really hard because some people just want to follow along with a tutorial or a course or whatever. And at the end, they've built the thing. But like really the value doesn't come from building a thing. It comes from like, okay, can I use this tutorial to build something sort of similar, but not the same, like far enough away that I'm going to have to learn some stuff along the way. And those people tend to be the ones who get the most value out of reading tutorials or courses or workshops or whatever else. So that's, that's the biggest piece of advice I give to people is like, you need to be doing more than just following along. Yeah. And to add to that, don't copy and paste the code from the browser into your editor. Type it in, type it in. Hand type it, hand type that code. It's muscle memory and you will learn the code so much easier. (laughs) If you just copy paste it, you're not learning anything. You're just, moving on like right. spend the time hand type it it's painful but it's awful but no th- right. those are really good points the hand typing is one of the things i loved about physical books was that there was no copy paste it's like <laughs> good luck buddy <laughs> forcing you to do it yeah yeah there is truth to that the interesting enough the other day I, I ran sort of a quick twitter poll um obviously limited to to my audience and my reach and whatnot so but i wanted you know of, of the folks who, who who follow me you know Pretty much, mostly ninety percent of them are technologists, you know, engineers in some way. Um, I wanted to find out how they learn technical content, right? And and I had the options I had on there were like a video, blogs, uh, documentation, or, or something like that. But basically, not the kind of content, but the medium. What what medium do they use, right, to learn? And I was expecting video to be the runaway winner. It actually ended up being like a nice uh, sort of a distribution across all the different mediums, including the reading the long way watching videos, reading tutorials and how-tos, and sort of having a live training and that kind of thing. So again, reinforcing the idea that different people learn different ways. But in the comments, what I was getting, there was, there was, there was like an underlying thread there. What I was getting was that many folks need a, a, a combination of mediums, 
right? To, to reinforce their learning, right? And, and I, saw, I saw myself in that group because like literally if I'm trying to learn a topic, right? I will get the video on Udemy. I will buy the book, you know, on Amazon. I will, you know, find the live training workshop to attend. I will like basically, I'm, I'm approaching it like in almost like a 360 style, right? Because I'm going to get something from one of these instructors or teachers that I'm not going to get from the other one. So I, I try to get myself like a like complete 360 degree sort of a, a knowledge, right? Even before I jump in to start actually writing code, right? I'm not sure what you call these kinds of learners, but I, I, I spend a lot of time sort of a gathering like knowledge before I start to apply anything, right? And again, to that might be sort of slightly different from the typical sort of um, or, or, or uh, the recommendation to, hey, like learn it, apply it, type it and whatnot. Some learners like myself, we like to gather a lot of knowledge before we start to applying it, right? But it's a different way of actually a, a different mechanism of knowledge acquisition. Yeah, see, I'm the opposite of that because what I'll do is I'll start to build something and mm. I use that almost to guide my learning. That's what I do. Yeah. Oh, also, but I should just say, you mentioned Amazon. I should just say other tax dodging mega stores are all <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> I am a bit more like Matt. I, I like to start with a practical problem. I struggle reading thick textbooks. <laughs> That's just never been my forte. Mm. You know, which when I first started programming, that's all we had. I mean, there wasn't in the mid nineties, late nineties, there wasn't a lot of online video courses and tutorials mm. and like you got a book at the store and you hope that it was up to date, uh, you know, <laughs> but I, I like the practical approach. I need to, to have a problem that needs solving, then start working with it and investigate it. And I, I often, if I have like a big project I'm working on for a client or something, I'll often, and there's a piece of it, I'll say, oh, I really need to do this. I've never done this before. Or, you know, maybe there's a new API I need to work with or a library that I'm going to have to work with. And so I'll kind of just open up a simple main basic project and I'll start just a rudimentary playing with in there and I'll pull up docs and I'll watch some videos and I'll read some blog posts until I get something that is actually working and that simplistic kind of almost linear, yeah. right, serialized programming top to bottom just to get it to work. That's how I learn. I need to physically be in the problem to get the education out of it. There's an interesting sort of dynamic going on here. I'm wondering, like, if teachers feel the need or rather some teachers feel the need to get enough of a, of a complete sort of broad set of knowledge, right? Uh, but then they advise their students to not learn in that way. They advise to learn, their learners to actually get the hands-on, you know, rather than try to acquire all the knowledge, right, first. Uh, because that that's part of my reasoning, right? That That's why I sort of try to acquire as much of the knowledge as possible, right, before, because only then do I feel comfortable telling somebody this is what you should learn and how you should learn it, right? Mm, because I, right. I feel the need to know enough Right a, a, about a topic, right? I need mean, I need feel I need to develop expertise on a topic before I can then pretend to be a teacher for that thing. Oh, we're <laughs> talking about teaching versus learning. Absolutely, <laughs> hmm. I'm well, not going to go and teach anybody how to write. You know, mumps. I've never written mumps in my life. I'm not going to pretend to sit there and teach people how to write mumps code. But learning is, uh, you know, I think is a very mm -hmm. different process. At least for me, anyway. For me, learning is is that hands on. I mm -hmm. got to be practical. I can't get it into my head any other way. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, my I don't want to self-promote, but I do have a book still available. <laughs> uh, you can get it on Amazon and other oh, no. tax dodging superstars. I just want to let people know there are other books available. Oh, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> not just Matt's. <laughs> there are other non-Matt Ryer books available on him. There are. There actually, there's loads. Most of them aren't written by me. But my book is a blueprints book. So it is about building real things. So in a way, I, that the way I learn is kind of the way I teach. And I also extend that to trying not to over teach or trying not to include everything, right? I try and pick the important bits enough for people to be useful so they can do something and then start that reward process that you get when you when you code something and it works, you know, if you can catch it, that, that to me is what then inspires the next bit of learning. And it's kind of that tight feedback loop. So the sooner you can build something real, uh, for me, that's a very exciting thing. Uh, it may not be the case for everybody, but yeah. And I think the criticism from, in some cases might be, 
you didn't tell the whole story there. You've only touched the surface or something. And there's, you know, there's lots of compl- there's loads of other things that people sh- could know about this particular thing. And I try and focus on pra- what's pragmatic, what's practical, what can be useful, because really that's what we need to start with. And then it guides your learning, right? If if you need something more, you 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 know because you're blocked. Yeah. You also have to be sure you don't over stimulate too you know you don't Mm. want to throw too much information at people at any given time because even if it's practical and incredibly relevant information it's got to be handed out in small doses Mm. that people get it so one of the big things like you know we focus on at go for guys in our content is when you see a slide it's that slides about one topic one thing uh and it could just be just a very simple thing, one way of variable declaration. And that's all we talk about on that one slide. And the code example is maybe it's a bigger code example because we need more code for whatever, but we only show the three or four relevant lines to the, to the student because we only want you to focus on those three or four lines that are important to this slide, to the topic we're talking about. You know, and if you show, and I, I found if you show somebody a huge complex code example, you know what they're going to do? They're going to spend the whole time just staring and trying to figure out this huge code complex code example. They're not going to follow what you're saying. If you show them three or four lines and you just move through those slides, right? You're you're giving them the whole picture just a little bit at a time, you know. And then it all it all kind of catches up by the time you get to the exercise, you know. Like now it's like okay, take all those little bits and you can build something a little bit bigger. Um, but it's hard. You don't want to. You can't overload people either. And I see it all the time. That's one of the worst things you could do as a teacher. Yeah. Another thing that happens sometimes, if there's, if you've just made up an example, just because it doesn't matter. Sometimes I've done it where in my example is not a good example, and that becomes then the focus. And um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and that get, obviously gets in the way then. So that's a fail yeah. on my part where I've and usually only you know breaking it down and only showing the relevant bits is a good way to avoid that sort of noise that otherwise can get in the way it is it's also really hard you just touched on something very important matt which is writing examples is probably the hardest thing you have to do as a programming teacher right because we you know we keep talking about go but really we're just talking about programming languages right it all this applies to every other programming language on the planet right this is not that's particular and, and to honestly learning anything uh, <laughs> or teaching anything in general but you yeah it's um oh, i've lost my train of thought <laughs> well writing examples is hard you use the beatles a lot don't you I do use the Beatles a lot. Um, that's just because I'm, I'm a big Beatles fan. Yeah. Uh, well, they offer what's interesting. They they offer just enough um, variety. You know, there's four names that they're not hard names. They're not long names. They got they play instruments. They have some like just little bits that you could kind of use, and they're good enough to give you more than two or three. Because two or three things in an example is usually too small. Um, but anything more than five or six is way too big. Right? It's just too complex. So like three or four is usually a good example. But finding small tight, concrete examples of the thing that you want to show that's also kind of real worldy too, because the smaller and tighter you try to get an example, often the less practical that example becomes. Mm -hmm. And that, it becomes a toy. And I'll tell you, we spend so much time, Corey and I, sitting at Zooms together, talking about examples, going, this one just doesn't work in class. It's too small, it's too complex, or it's not showing the problem tight enough, you know, and it's hard. That's the hardest, the words, the, that stuff's the easy part. It, it's those descriptions. That's what people see the, you know, the developers want to see code. And if you show them code, it's going to be good code that illustrates it exactly. And that's really hard. <laughs> I think this is one of the reasons why so many people struggle with structure. Aside from the fact that like, there's not a one single solution. It's that when you try to show examples, it's really hard to show an example that's small enough to actually take in at once while also right. appreciating the benefits of like, this is why we structured it this way. And this is why it works because you almost need a large code base for that to make sense. Especially when you get into like the more complex structures where you're know, like, you're using domain driven design. It's like real, really, if you're building a hello world app, domain driven design is just complete overkill. It's not helping you. So it's like, yeah. how do we give an example that illustrates these points and is complex enough to feel the pains that, you know, this might solve while also being simple enough that you can actually take it in in a short period of time. 
My my trick to that is to is to offer sort of a, um, layered examples that basically as we get through the the curriculum, right? I'm basically reintroducing you, saying, "Hey, remember in the last module we talked about this, right? Now we're going to add an additional layer of complexity to that, right? So it's building up that sort of mental model, right, and introducing more complicated things. But basically, you have the same one or two set of exercises that are getting incrementally more complex. That way, it's not a completely new problem you have to solve with each new example of code I'm showing you with each new module. It's just a continuation, right? Which is why I, I, I really enjoy projects that sort of take that approach to say, hey, we're going to build a Kubernetes cluster together, right? So, and, and, and then we start from the ground up, right? And then we, we keep adding layers, right? But, but by the end, you know, you're going to get a fully working Kubernetes cluster or something like that, right? But but we in, introducing in, in the, the topics and adding the necessary bits as we go, right? But you, you have something you're working towards. Mm, that's great. Yeah. How would, would you have any advice for people that want to get into training? And I'm also going to ask a cheeky question. Like, is don't. It, is it good money? Is it good money? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good, it's a good job if you can get it. Um, <laughs> it's, a, you know, here's the thing, you know, we, 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 we've really just been talking a lot about in person, like the, the, the actual presentation of the material. And we've mm -hmm. just at the end there, we were starting to touch a little bit on like code examples and stuff like that. But what I think people really don't understand is that when you go to teach something, if you want to teach three days, you have to have three days of content. And three yeah. days of content doesn't grow on trees. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it takes you a lot longer than three days to write three days worth of content. It takes months. Um, so if you tomorrow say, I'm just going to go and start teaching, well, good luck to you because you're not going to get very far unless you're really ready to sit down and spend hours and hours and hours fretting over your content. You could just buy John's course and play it on an iPod in your ear. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be pretty. pretty I'd do that. You could, yeah, that would, that would be the same. You have to have that same same tone. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it'd be hard because my stuff isn't designed for like in the classroom, really. But maybe. Mm. <laughs> but like Johnny mentioned this earlier, where as educators we like to learn everything, like really understand all of it, and then we sort of figure out, okay, this is how I'd recommend learning it. Now that I've like actually spent a large amount of time, you know, learning this all. And I think that's where a lot of the value in these trainings and workshops and all this stuff comes from is not just in the content. It's the fact that I've spent hundreds of hours figuring this, figuring out the best way for you to spend 40 hours and learn the most amount of content. And, and like a lot of people are like, why does it cost so much? It's like, look, you can do this on your own, but given that you, you know, as a developer, you probably make at least 25 bucks an hour, probably much more than that. And it's like, it, it, it's really cheap in comparison to how much time you're going to waste. Right. So, and this is where, you know, it was slightly deviated into talking about sort of the business value. I don't want to sound like a suit, but really, this is where you kind of have to look at, okay, what what am I paying, but what am I getting in return here? So, you're not just getting basically, you know, uh, you know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 300 bucks, $1,000 worth of, worth, of, worth of content. What you're getting is, and let's be honest, anything that I teach in my classroom, and, and I'll go as far as to say anything that all of us on the panel here teach, you can Google around for it if you want. Right. Yeah. There's nothing that we're teaching that is proprietary or magical. There's nothing you're going to learn in our classrooms that, you know, with sufficient time and persistence that you're not going to find out there and teach yourself. I mean, you know, this, this well, how knowledge is out there. How do you think? Exactly. How do you think we found it? Right. <laughs> the, the value, the value is in having somebody who spent the time, right, distilling all of that stuff down to the key nuggets, right, to help you pick it up, right, in 40 hours rather than 400 hours. Right. So yeah. what is your time? worth right you know we find joy and satisfaction and hopefully monetary gain from doing this work because you know we enjoy doing it but really at the end of the day is like what is your time worth to you right do, do you want to sp spend 400 dollars googling around until you learn and master something or your team's or your, your team's team. time when you're talking right, yeah. 30 people that's a lot of time that's a lot of money that's <laughs> a, a lot, lot of, of time money, and a money. Lot of time yeah absolutely like to even you know, back it, johnny's point I've talked to people who make courses where literally everything taught in the course is available for free on their blog. Yep. It's just not all put together on one big project Packaged. in a really nice yep. order. And they're like, look, people pay just for that. Yep. Like, it yeah. doesn't matter that it's all there free. They'll read one little bit free as a blog article and be like, I want the whole course. I don't want to go searching for the rest of this. Yep. Well, that's kind of the Michael Hartle Rails tutorial model where he mm -hmm. 
uh, gives away the or used to. He doesn't. I don't think he does it anymore. He used to give away the entire Rails tutorial book online for free mm-hmm. as HTML. You, know, you could read the HTML version, or you could spend hundreds of the videos and the PDFs and EPUBs. And he does great with it. And, and I can't tell you how many people I've seen go up to him and thank him a hundred times over for his courses and stuff like that. Yeah. We'll be out at a conference or hanging out and people just come up to him and thank him all the time. But he did that. He didn't get there by accident either. (laughs) Again, he puts a lot of effort and time into all that. So if you're thinking about getting into teaching, consider all that we've just said about that, that time and that effort. I would just say, start small and start small, start small and see if you like it. Cause it's good to have more teachers. So if you're really interested, one of the things I always recommend, and when I used to um, run teams, development teams, I used to uh, force brown bag lunches like every two weeks uh, and force the engineers, all of the engineers, one at a time to do a presentation during a brown bag lunch. Uh, And it could be on the library, a plugin, something that they're working on in work. It doesn't really matter. It's a safe, small environment, half a dozen of us in a room, you know, whatever. But it gives everybody a chance to stand up and start to learn a little bit of how to teach and how to mentor. Because at the end of the day, as we grow in our careers, whether we make our livings as as, uh, educators or we're just, you know, we're working in dev shops as senior developers or directors or VPs or whatever. As you move up through your career, mentoring and teaching is a big part of your job. And as you move up, that's why you get paid so much. (laughs) <laughs> you get paid to men- mentor the people below you and you've got to start learning how to do that now. So if you are thinking of that or you're just looking at your future prospects, I think you need to start, try doing some of those things in line, like at, at your company, just a brown bag, teach some stuff, have other people teach some stuff. I think you'll do great. Yeah, well, it's that time again. Uh, Bates, hold this bass guitar, mate. Uh, John, get on the drums. <laughs> Johnny, <laughs> piano. Hmm? It's mm-hmm. time for Unpopular Opinions. I actually think you should probably leave. Do we have any unpopular opinions about teaching? <laughs> <laughs> Mark's really confused by that, but they're going to put the music in, aren't they? Has Mark <laughs> been off the show that long? Dimensionally, Marty. I don't want to offend anybody, but I guess without a better way of putting it, I mm-hmm. think the smartest people often make the worst teachers. Mm. Um, Thank you. I- <laughs> <laughs> Bates is brilliant. Trying to decide by the way. which which yeah. which way I should be offended. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Either I'm. Either I'm a great teacher and I'm really stupid, or I'm a terrible teacher and I'm really smart. So I'm trying to figure out where I sit in there. <laughs> Tell us um, what you mean, though, John. That's interesting. So, so what I mean by this is, in my opinion, the smartest people tend to be people who get things very quickly. They don't struggle with them, so they don't really start to relate with how the average person is going to learn the material. So as a result, the smartest people are the people who can't produce a like learning path that is going to appeal to the average person and they're just going to kind of go too quickly. Um, the best examples I can give is I had a friend in college who had, it was like a Calc 2 class or something. And every time somebody would ask a question, they had this genius math teacher who would just be like, oh yeah, it's real simple. And he just, you know, throw something up on the chalkboard real quick. And the whole class would sit there like, we don't know what you just said. Like we do not understand anything you wrote on the board. Um, and I think part of it was because he, it all just made sense to him and it all clicked. So he didn't quite understand where they were struggling or what, you know, he didn't have the empathy to really relate to them. Maybe he just needs to be a bit smarter. <laughs> <laughs> so what I mean by that is it's smart people can become good teachers. I think they just naturally, if they take what they learned and the way they learned it, it's not going to do well. Um, another way I've sort of phrased this is I feel like you have to be dumb enough to struggle with the material so you understand how the average person is going to struggle, but you have to be smart enough to figure out how to teach the stuff that you struggled with. And I just feel like the smartest people don't necessarily have that struggle. Mm. I think you've managed to find an unpopular opinion. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm calling very, myself dumb as well. So it's an interesting helps. opinion. I don't know if I fully agree with it, but uh, I, I, I can kind of see what you're saying. Um, I think there are definitely a class of really smart people who, who struggle with interpersonal skills 
and who struggle connecting with people and they, you know, and, and, and primarily live in their heads. Um, and they definitely make terrible teachers because they, they're not, they're not willing to, to slow their brains down or don't know how to slow their brains down and again. But I don't think it has anything to do really with smarts, but more in terms of the personality and those mm. interpersonal skills, because if you're really smart and you have interpersonal skills, you can make those cognitive leaps and you can say, Hey, you know, how am I going to get this person from A to B? Um, you know, and I, I think you have to be smart to, to, to do that sort of stuff, but you have yeah. to have the personal skills. I think See, that's is, the difference. Smart is the, is really not the right word, but I don't know the correct word for it. Mm. It's almost like the people who just like innately get things are, are not necessarily the best teachers. And I realize that to generalization, there are exceptions. So like, I don't expect that to be true of everybody. John, I think I'm I'm gonna connect the dots for you, right? Okay. So, so, and I don't know if it's an unpopular opinion or not, but those who are smart and know it, right, and bring that right to the teaching with them, right? I think those make the 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 poor teachers, right? In teaching and training other people, right, your ego, right, does not belong there, mm. right, because it's not about you. Right. right. You are trying to convey information. You're trying to relay information. You're trying to teach another person how to fish. Right. To 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 paraphrase the old proverb. Right. So it's it's not, has nothing to do with you. You you're you're just a conduit. Right. For information. So if you go on stage, you know, whether you're giving a conference talk or whether you're on a, a podcast of, of professional uh, teachers as a panelist or something, insulting them all, <laughs> or your or your math. You know, or, your mat, or your mat, or your mat, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you do this professionally or not, or on occasion, whatever the case may be, right? Like your ego, right, should not be part of that equation, right? It's about how you convey information to people in different ways, meeting them halfway, or meeting them where they're at, right? And, and sort of conveying that information. You're nothing but a conduit. Leave your ego out of it. Mm. Can I can I add to that and say uh, not only you're a conduit for teaching information, you're a two-way conduit because you should be learning while you're teaching. Um, yes. and, and if you're not learning while you're teaching, you're not going to be a good good teacher because um, you need to learn your audience. You need to learn who they are, learn how to talk to them, learn how to work with them. But also, like I think I said this earlier, you know, I, I, I'm not afraid in class when I get asked a question to say, honestly, I have no idea. Yeah, I've never right. thought of that before. I've never seen yep. that before. That would never cross my mind. And I'm okay saying that because then the next thing I say is, you know what? Let's open up Vim. Let's see what happens. Exactly. Right. Let's learn together. And, and, and it, you know, and great. Now I know. Now I know. Mm -hmm. And I've learned something from that class that I didn't know before I went to. Like I said, we try to, you know, Corey and I try to make an effort of putting that right back into the material. Um, right. So we could, so we have it for the next time. So it's like, yeah, someone asked a, a great question. We didn't have an answer. We didn't have a slide. We're going to learn that answer. We're going to learn how to present that. And we're going to give it back to the next class that comes along. Um, mm -hmm. and if you're not willing to do that, you're going to be a pretty <laughs> teacher. Yep. I've struggled with how to, how to convey that opinion just because what? like, I, I don't want to tell people like, cause I, like, I completely agree with you guys, not this swearing. <laughs> <laughs> It's a struggle to convey that opinion because it's almost like I'm saying somebody who learns how to present material and like has the smarts to understand their audience and like relate with them and figure out the best way to teach them isn't smart. And that's not what I mean. It's I think it's more like Johnny said, there are some people who are, it's almost like they're just so focused on their own intelligence and, and showing people how intelligent they are. Yeah. They, they live up here. Yeah. They, and like they don't, up here. they have that's to be it. able to step down and like relate to the audience. And I, I think in my experience, at least with university and stuff, the ones, the teachers who tended to be like that were the ones who were there strictly for research and they were forced to teach a class and it showed like they were not, mm. they were not teachers. They were very smart people who did not want to be teachers. Who wrote some on the whiteboard and expected you to know it. And that was it. And that, you know, that was, yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> That's your second strike, Bates. <laughs> oh, one man, I'm um, I, So, do you have any funny stories? Because I actually have. I I did teach the. Okay, two guys guides. walk into a bar. No, no, hang on. <laughs> I taught the Gopher Guides material in London, Bates, if you remember. Yeah. Yes, and at the end of the the three days, this young man came up to me and said, "I think I'm your cousin," and I'd, I'd never <laughs> met him before. And it turns out he was my cousin. 
And he learned that as a result of you teaching the Go yeah. for God's material. I was teaching a class at a company, and wow. yeah, I found a I found a cousin. So you can you can get extra cousins <laughs> if you do teaching. That's one of the perks. I suppose um, it could I'm, have been worse. He could have introduced himself as your son. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're my dad because of this channel's example. <laughs> Not yeah. quite sure how a buffered channel yeah. would get you to that conclusion, but okay. <laughs> Oh, man. He got into the unsafe package. I think so. <laughs> yes. Well, oh, there's, there's nothing standard about this. Just in time. <laughs> and to save Mark's career, we are going to end here. <laughs> so thank you so much to... I think it's our... too late to save my career. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much for listening, everyone. Um, we'll see you next time. Comment on this and every episode of GoTime on changelog.com. There's a discussion link in your show notes for easy click-ins. We would love to hear from you. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter. We are at GoTimeFM. This episode was hosted by Matt Ryer with John Calhoun, Johnny Borsico, and Mark Bates. It was produced by me, Jared, and our beats are by the Breakmaster Cylinder. Shout out to all of our longtime sponsors. Thanks again to Fastly, Linode, and Rollbar. Cloud Native Go with Aaron Schlesinger next week.